Hey, and welcome. Thanks so much, Tom, for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you about um, all the work that you're doing for the show. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be able to participate in this. That's really cool. Um, I am Laura Brody, and I am the primary curator and founder of Opulent Mobility. And for description purposes, I am a middle-aged Caucasian woman with brown hair in front of a very full bookshelf with some art and a cast of my foot. And Tom, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm, for, again, for the purpose of description, I'm a middle-aged Caucasian man, brown glasses, uh, ponytail, <laughs> wearing a black shirt. And um, in the background is really not that much terribly interesting, except I have my instrument back there. But <laughs> so it, describe your instrument. My instrument is a double bass meant to be bowed, and it is electric. It's amplified, so there's no body to it. It's just a stick, and it has six strings, oh. which gives it the range of two-thirds of a piano. Nice, and much less heavy to held. <laughs> well, when you start putting the speakers and... Uh, mm, yeah. It's actually a lot more complicated than the acoustic one. Yeah, the equipment is always the problem, right? I, I never knew. When I started getting into doing electronic music, I really had no idea how much of my life would be spent wrapping cables. It's the things you don't expect. I was like, how much of your time is schlepping? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly it. I, I've spent more time with that with art. It, with music, you wouldn't always think about it. But the equipment is going to be such a big part of it and traveling safely with it. Mm -hmm, definitely. So how did you find out about Opulent Mobility? Uh, it was actually through LA Culture Net. Oh, nice. The, okay. Uh, that's the list serve from the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture. Um, and I saw the, the opportunity um, calling for artworks for disabled artists and for artists with disabilities. And because I'm a person on the autism spectrum, I thought this is something that could be really interesting. And also, as I've progressed in my rather odd career, I'm wanting to do more installation work. So this is only the second bit of installation work that I've done. The first was an online installation work I did for the National Park Service as part of the uh, Terminus project at Olympic National Park. And I, I did... Uh, Neat. It was an interesting project because they wanted us to memorialize um, a, a dying glacier. And so a whole oh, bunch of different wow. artists signed a different glacier in the park. and. Uh, so I used uh, 100 years worth of climate data for the Eel Glacier um, on Mount Anderson, if you know uh, Olympic National Park. Yeah. To, wow. To, Somewhat. To depict climate change and the uh, the rise of ambient temperature and the shrinking of the glacier. Wow. So what an interesting project. That was really an interesting one. Yeah. So how did you use the data to create your music? It's funny, sometimes I wanted to do sonification and I, which is using data, which is basically turning data into sound. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, my thought was to use the bass line is the mountain itself and that just continues. Then there is a, a pad of chords that I used six different voices and um, each one, my original idea was that each six month period would depict the rise in temperature wow. as, as it goes up. And, and it turns out the climate data didn't actually um, cooperate. So I had to do oh, that. <laughs> I, had, I had to kind of do an, an aggregate with it going up exponentially. And, and I was able to use the, the coral rise there. And then for to depict the glacier, I used the um, Introit from the uh, Requiem Mass. Oh, wow. So Perfect. Each time that loops, it gets shorter and shorter until it's down to a single note. Wow. So it's a Requiem for a, gla a Glacier. That's the name of the piece, actually. It's Requiem for a Glacier. Well, perfect, Ben. <laughs> so, so what made you decide to do music that can be experienced by deaf people? or hard of hearing people, because that is so exciting and we haven't done it before. So I'm really happy to have it involved. This comes from one of my former teachers, Jeff Branatich, uh, who is now, he was teaching at Northwestern University when I was there. And um, now I guess he's teaching in North Texas State, but um, he had released a series of albums on a label he created called Music for All to Hear. 
Mm. And what he was doing was playing, this first album was playing Christmas carols, but playing them on the bass in the lower register so that people who had hmm. hearing difficulties could hear it. Because most often people with hearing difficulties can either sense the vibration of bass frequencies or they can actually hear up to, I think it's about 80 hertz, is where most people who are considered deaf or who are hard of hearing can hear those tones. So as we began to work on, as you and I had our discussions, yeah. I decided to try something like that so that this, it, it, the music that I've written for Opulent Mobility is all ambient. So most of the music, most people are not going to hear the entire piece. It's supposed to just stay in the background. But people who are, have hearing difficulties will experience a piece differently because it's very, it's, driven melodically by the bass. So the bass frequencies are something that that people who have hearing difficulties will ex can actually experience that and people who don't have hearing experience uh, difficulties will experience something actually quite different because they'll hear the other sounds. So it's kind of like a hidden code for people. Interesting. Yeah, I, I've actually seen people do things, for example, uh, exhibits or designs that were created for people with certain forms of colorblindness. So what you would see if you had a certain type of colorblindness mm -hmm. would be a completely different thing if you had a different type or that if you didn't experience that. So it's it's always fascinating to me how like how that how individual our experiences are mm -hmm. and that so much of it I think gets flattened, you know, in the way that most people try to make it so that everybody's feeling the same way that's that's never going to be true mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think this is wonderful i'm also really excited that you're going to be doing it live for the opening yes that's going to be really fun so i mean the 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 base that is behind me here i'm going to be using with um looping and interactive electronics neat computer. So, so yeah fine. how many you were just talking about this, or we were just talking about this before we started. How many pieces of musical instruments do you have in your home? Oh my god! About <laughs> that's really hard to okay. About say about. Well, I've got I've got this. I've also got my acoustic bass, which is you know that that's that's a big one there. I've got two banjos, one from each grandfather, a mandolin. I've got about six ukuleles, and I have those are small. <laughs> I have a box that up in the closet that is labeled noisy toys <laughs> because anytime I go somewhere ah! where there are toys, where there's something, I always try to find some kind of noise making thing and they invariably find it, find their way into my, they invariably find their way in, into my, my pieces somewhere or another. <laughs> Do you have a Furby up there? I don't have a Furby. <laughs> that should be the next one. That would well, I have a fur baby sitting next to me here, but that's different. <laughs> that's a totally different thing. And that makes its own noise. And that's that's their job. Getting him to bark on cue is something I've not been able to figure out. <laughs> yeah, I have seen people play with that, but um I think that they record them as that happens. Yes. <laughs> that is what got you into music to begin with? Um I have my parents were very musical. My father played stride piano, which is, if you're familiar with that, that is mm -mm. the old style of hitting hitting a bass note with your left hand and then airplaning over about two octaves. Oh, yeah. Boom, 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 boom. It's extremely difficult. But my dad learned to play stride piano. He actually was really good at it. So neat. Music, my mom was an accordion virtuoso. And so music was just always playing in the in the house. And, and um, I, I always knew my dad played classical music and I knew I would always, classical music would always be part of my life. And um, the, from the time I, my father played a recording of Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture when I was five years old, loved it, gave me the record, God bless him. And I, I wore the grooves out on that thing and tore ah. my poor sister with cannons. <laughs> well, it's very exciting. Was that one of the first pieces of music that you really just bonded with? It was. And um, I got, I actually got to the point that after about a year of playing it, when I was about six years old, I no longer needed the album. 
Interesting. I could play it in my head and I can still reconstruct it. That's really cool. So yeah, but that that kind of started me down started me down the path. And uh, so yeah, so I've always I've had kind of a meandering career as um, uh, and I'm trained as an orchestral double bassist, and I've done solo work, and uh, um, have a Grammy nomination for the music of John Cage. Nice so solo work. I've done chamber music, and I, I sort of at, at, at the tender age of fifty, I started composing, and um, it, it's sort of I got kind of dragged backward, kicking and screaming into it, and so. Uh, oh wow! What happened? I had a regular concert series at the uh, Theater of Boston Court in Pasadena. Okay, yes. Doing, um, a residency, I would do three contemporary music recitals per year. So I was doing all new music. And at one point, I I bought the electric instrument and I was trying to, I, trying to figure out what to do with it. I thought, you know, this would work really well as an accompaniment for silent films. So I mm. asked them, if I could do a silent film score to Der Bolum, uh, the 1920 horror film. So they did it at Hollywood. They, they liked it and asked me to do it again. And so I, now 18 silent film scores later, um, I started, I started doing that. And eventually I was started improvising and it, it, it then got to the point where I had to start writing things down. <laughs> so oh, it just, now it's become serious. <laughs> It's, it, I, I think about the way my career has gone, and I think I am a composer. How? <laughs> Don't, because you had to be. I, I, I guess so. <laughs> sometimes that's what happens. I know that's happened to me with art. So yeah. sometimes it's, it grabs you kicking and screaming and says, this is what needs to be made. Yeah. You know, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Have you found that autism has had an effect on your work? Is that something you found out earlier on or later in life? I uh, was diagnosed as being on the um, autism spectrum disorder in, at the age of 47. So I found it may have just explained a lot of things. Um, I, as, as far as the, the work for opulent mobility and some, a lot of the, the recent, more recent compositions I've been doing have been, there is a need when one is on the autism spectrum to find calming spaces. And mm -hmm. that is extremely difficult to find in LA County. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a challenge. And, and so I, I began wanting to create places where people could heal and respond. And so, I mean, it really, I started doing this sort of work. First thing during the pandemic, I created an album of um, music for people to help, help people fall asleep. Mm. and um, using rain sounds and sounds of crickets and so forth with music that changes. It, it's something I call process music. I, I, there's probably a better term for it out there. But, mm. and, and the music that I've, I've written for the, for the Opulent Mobility show is, it has different musical elements, and different threads, but they're all at different lengths. So they it's what I call um, collisions and collusions music. It's sort of sometimes they go together and sometimes they don't. But the way things are written, none of them will actually line up the same way for many, many, many hours. So it's music that ah. has, it has a certain it has a certain cohesiveness to it because it's all based on the same scales and the same tones. But the music that you're hearing won't be repeated while you're there. Nice. Do you mind if I play a brief sample of that? I don't mind at all. All right. So I'm going to do a little screen share. The musical sample. I can feel how this will be a really great background to what we're gonna be experiencing at the show. One of the things I, I decided to do on this is I have cut out the frequencies between about a hundred, was it about 80 Hertz and it's not about a hundred Hertz and about 250 Hertz. Um, that is the zone where of human conversation. Perfect. So I'm hoping with this that this is something that the music can be heard and felt, and yet people can still converse. Yeah. 
because that can always be tricky too. Like, and for some and people, that's too distracting to even pay attention to. Yeah. But a certain lower level, it can be okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Have you found that that sometimes having too many noises in different areas can be really distracting for you? Oh my gosh, constantly. This is this is this is yeah. where. Um, yeah, the, the, this is this is where being on the autism spectrum is, is can be a challenge. There's just too much stimulus going on at one time. Yeah. Do you find it's easier when you're performing though, because have, of the focus? It depends. I have something to focus on, but if there are other things happening in the space, I can sometimes have a. It, it depends, really. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of times uh, I've I've done a lot of work with contact improvisation dancers, and. Neat. I find in doing that, and if, if I'm playing in a space, well, for example, when, you know, when, in, at the opening of the optimal mobility, what I will do is watch people and listen to them and almost like create a soundtrack of the energy of the people in the room. Neat. It, and does that, I don't know, make it easier for you to work with it? Much easier, yeah. I would think, because you're responding to what is in front of you instead of trying to ignore it. it. It it incorporates it. Yeah, and that just makes, I think it makes it much better for everybody. Hopefully, I think so too. So I'm really excited to try this out. <laughs> oh. Is there anything else that you would like to share? Other projects you've got coming up, or um, you were saying that maybe this is a, t a lull time because you've had so much going on. I've had a lot going on. <laughs> Then, yeah, the next problem, project I'm working on is for uh, a friend of mine who is uh, teaches double bass at UC Irvine, and uh, he's doing a concert celebrating the 150th birth of bassist Sergei Kusevitsky. Oh, wow. So on a piece for bass and interactive electronics for him. So that's, that's, my, that's my, next, my next goal. Nice. My All right. We're working, we're working on, uh, my wife is a, a writer, and so we're, we're working on our second opera together. So that's our next. That's that's we're, amazing. Just getting started on that process. Or what is the topic? Do you mind me asking? Or is it too we're, soon? It's still, we're still, it's still cooking. <laughs> okay. That's fine. What is the first one? First one we did, um, we wrote on, we wrote on spec and unfortunately it didn't get accepted, but uh, we, we, we mm. kind of, we, we just love the process so much. We decided to launch into the second one. And the first one is a, um, it's a group therapy and it each person talks about what their experience in the pandemic was oh interesting because we both feel that that the the damage that we all sustained in the pandemic has not been dealt with and there are a lot of things that there, yeah. there, there seems to be a forgetting that we all went through something really traumatic and regardless of where one falls on the spectrum of that it was it was an extraordinarily traumatic event for all of us and um we and it's it's helping people kind of we're hoping it will help people sort of understand that we really have been through something and we need we, yeah we've not, we've not taken the time to process it and and that at some point we'll have to pay the piper for that yeah and that to a large extent, it is still going on. I think that's another thing that there's that whole froth of denial. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I am. I'm an avid mask wearer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it is. It's um. It's a rough. Sometimes that's the way people deal with trauma. Yes, mm -hmm. but pretending that there isn't a trauma will bite you in the butt later. Yes. It's guaranteed. <laughs> You can only do so much of whistling past the graveyard. At some point, you're going to have to stop and read the tombstones. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And somebody's going to be there, you know. Yes. Yeah. But I'm so glad that you can be part of this show. And um, well, thank you so much for including me. I'm, I'm, I am so excited about this. I was so glad you reached out. This was, by the way, he reached out to me and was like, is it okay if I do this? Is that something you're interested in? Like, Yes, please. This will be amazing. Uh, I love having that multi-layered effect of it. And we haven't been using music as much. And I think that that's such a great and important thing to include. Wonderful. I'm, I'm honored to be part of it.